Imagine if God came down to earth, embodied in human form, wearing clothes, interacting with people. Imagine if God was kind of like a person living among other people. That is, of course, a central premise of Christianity. That is also the central premise of a great old classic movie, Oh God, which came out in 1977, starring George Burns as God and John Denver as his prophet. And in the climactic scene of Oh God, it's a trial scene, George Burns as God takes the stand and he's trying to prove, he's trying to make the case to a skeptical judge, to a skeptical jury, to a skeptical packed courthouse, to a skeptical viewing public, that God is real, that God can make a difference in your life. So George Burns' God starts by doing some amazing magic tricks, and these actually are quite amazing, and that kind of got people's attention. And then he is talking to the courthouse, and he disappears, but continues to talk. So you hear his voice, but you don't see him. It's an invisible soliloquy. And that definitely gets people's attention. But it's what he says in his invisible soliloquy that my dean when I was a rabbinical student, Rabbi William Lebo, the dean of the seminary, thought this was so profound that in our final session of his practical rabbinics course, he summoned up this last scene from Oh God. And Rabbi Lebo told these graduating rabbinical students, he said, it is inevitable that over the course of your lives, over the course of your career, people are going to ask you, you are going to ask yourself, is this whole religious project worth it? Is God real? Does Judaism actually make a difference in people's lives? And Rabbi Lebo said, in his mind, the best answer to that was what George Burns' God says in O oh God in the Invisible Soliloquy, just two words. It works. It works. Religion, God, Judaism can help people survive and thrive, especially when the going gets toughest. It works. And I was thinking of George Burns' line this past week when I read about a fascinating study done at Harvard by the Human Flourishing Program, directed by Tyler Vander Will. Um, and the context for this study is that in America for a long time, well before the pandemic, our nation has been struggling with something that a pair of Princeton economists, Angus Deaton and Anne Case, who happened to be married to each other, they coined this phrase, deaths of despair. And they observed that there has been for some time a surge in tragic deaths of Americans that are brought about by sheer despair, by the sense that life is not worth living. And the people take their lives through one of three forms, actual suicide, or drug abuse, or alcohol abuse. And the deaths of despair are surging, especially in our heartland, and especially among whites, both men and women, who do not have a college education. And because of the surge in deaths of despair, drugs, alcohol, suicide, life expectancy in our beloved nation has actually been going down. Enter this project that Tyler Vanderwill was directing at the Human Flourishing Program. They wanted to find out how does the phenomenon of deaths of despair intersect with the healthcare profession. We all have I think now, an even deeper appreciation of how demanding a career is in healthcare, 
long hours, high stakes, high burnout rate. And what this study wanted to find out is, to what extent are healthcare professionals with these high stakes and this intensity and this burnout, to what extent are they vulnerable to deaths of despair? To what extent might doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals just abuse drugs, abuse alcohol, take their own lives? So they studied this question for over 20 years. And they decided to focus on a single question. Would attending religious services at least once a week, would attending religious services at least once a week have an impact on a doctor or nurse or healthcare professional being vulnerable to deaths of despair? And they studied this among more than 66,000 women and among more than 43,000 men. So all told, more than 100,000 healthcare professionals for over 20 years. And here's what they found. It's just so interesting and so powerful. They compared women who attended religious services at least once a week to women who never attended religious services. And guess what? Among women who attended religious services at least once a week, they were found to be 68% less likely to commit suicide or do drugs or alcohol abuse. Or put this way, women who never attended religious services were 68% more likely to succumb to a death of despair. Among men, men who attended religious services at least once a week were 33% more likely to not succumb to suicide or drug or alcohol abuse. Men who never attended religious services were 33% more likely to take their own lives through a death of despair. In other words, going to shul saves your life. Going to church saves your life. Going to your mosque saves your life. Taking your religion seriously saves your life. Engaging your faith communities, faith services every week saves your life. Over 100,000 people, 20 years. It matters. It works. Now, I was emailing with a very good friend about the study and he pointed out that the study is fascinating, but there is an inherent ambiguity that is unresolved in the study. As he put it, what's at the bottom of the study? Is it correlation or is it causation? Is it correlation? That is to say that people who, by their own nature, are more centered and more grounded and more strong and by their very nature are more able to handle the ups and downs of life, those are the people who are drawn to religious services, so there's a correlation, or is it causation that people go to their services and by virtue of the teachings and of the sacred scripture and of the music and of the song and of the community, they're somehow now stronger and more centered than when they went in? And he points out that that's an ambiguity. So the academic community can debate that one. Is it causation or correlation? But either way, it seems to me that this study supports George Burns' conclusion, it works. Either you come to your religious services strong and centered, or you become more strong and more centered as a result of your religious services. Either way, dramatically more likely not to succumb to a death of despair. Now, why is that? The study itself doesn't say, but it feels to me like this pandemic makes so clear why it is 
that regularly attending religious services can save your life. Because regularly attending religious services, I mean, this would be the best, one of the best silver linings of this pandemic. If this pandemic can cause you to rethink attending religious services, like, eh, it was never your thing, eh, you kind of did it every once in a while, but it wasn't a part of your life. If this pandemic can cause you to rethink that, that attending religious services can save my life because it offers me, it offers us three things that I can't get otherwise. Here's the first thing attending religious services does. It provides a very helpful antidote to the problem of loneliness. Before the pandemic of coronavirus, there was a well-known epidemic of loneliness in America. Studies show that almost half of adult Americans, almost half of adult Americans feel themselves to be alone and lonely, spend too much time alone watching TV, too much time alone eating too much, too much time alone drinking too much, too much time alone pining away, too much time alone wondering what to do, too much time alone. Loneliness, epidemic, and the pandemic only made it worse. And that's where religious services are so helpful because if you attend religious services at least once a week, you now have become part of a web of love and of connection, of community and of relationship where people see you, they care about you, they know when you're not here, and they reach out to help you. And that's, of course, true in the old days pre-COVID when we were in the same physical space. And it's true in our virtual world. Just recently, Aliza got a handwritten note from this woman. This, this says it all. She's 87 years old. She writes an 87-year-old penmanship, this thank you note. And she says, Dear Rabbi Aliza, I understand you've been coordinating volunteers. Just want to tell you that one hard day, I wake up. And I see outside our bags of groceries. There's Lysol, there's Clorox wipes, there's cleaning supplies, there's bread, there's milk, there's food. And I needed all of that. I needed the food and I needed the cleaning supply. But mostly, I needed somebody to see that I exist. I needed somebody to know that I need help. I needed somebody to know that I'm here. And when I saw that Lysol, and I saw that loaf of bread, I knew that somebody cares about me. So here's a check. Will you please use this check to buy groceries for somebody else, to let somebody else know that I see them and that your friends at Temple Emmanuel see them too? So here you have an 87-year-old woman who is giving tzedakah. She's giving love because she got love. It works. It is the antidote to loneliness. Here's the second way in which attending religious services will save your life, and it really works. In the face of all that's broken in our world, it is very tempting to say, what can I do? What can I do? Coronavirus, bigger than me. Unemployment, bigger than me. Race riots, bigger than me. Toxic division, bigger than me. Disease, bigger than me. What can I do? But if you are part of a religious community and you go to services, there happens to take place a very important shift from what can I do so what can I do? What can I do to make this a little better? There's a woman at Penn who was a second semester senior named Hadassah Raskis. She loved Penn. She loved college. She loved her classes. She loved her extracurricular. She loved 
her friends, and she looked forward to the last few months of college. And then, all gone. No closure, no last semester. She finds herself going to sleep and waking up in her high school bedroom in Silver Spring, Maryland. And now Hadassah Raskis is thinking, what happened to my life? What happened to our lives? And she's looking out at the world, and she sees deep need. She sees food insecurity. She sees panic buying. She sees empty shelves. She hears of people who are waiting in line hours and hours, hours and hours in a car, miles to get food. They're hungry. And she realizes, wait a minute, there's all these 18 and 22-year-olds. I'm not the only one who's home from college. The entire nation of people my age who were in college are home from college. What can I do? What can we do? Now, Hadassah Raskis was very active at Penn Hill. She would go to services every Shabbos. She had a whole Shabbos chevra. They reach out and they ask themselves the quintessential Jewish question. By the way, the quintessential question of any person of any faith. What can we do? How can we make this better? And so they come up with this concept called coronaconnects.org, a website. It takes less than one minute to complete. It's very simple and very profound. It matches people who need help with people who want to help. People who need help with people who want to help, and you fill it out in less than a minute, and they've made so many matches massively and nationally what can we do now? If you become part of a religious community, you're just instilled with a proneness to act, an action orientation. That's what our world needs now. And here's the third thing that if you attend services, you'll just find tremendously helpful. There is a need to make meaning out of our suffering. I mean, there's just so much suffering. All the numbers, you all know it. The numbers of death and the numbers of unemployed, you all know it. No marathon, you know it. No big gatherings, you know it. And now race riots in American cities and Minneapolis on fire, you know it. So much suffering. But now the question is, how do we make meaning out of this suffering? That's just a basic human quest. So how do you do it? So here's the truth. You could read every book in the Bible. You could read every tractate in the Talmud. And odds are you're not going to come upon some verse or some passage that all of a sudden turns on a light bulb and you say, oh, now I get it. Because of this verse, now I understand all the suffering in the world. That's not how making meaning happens. Making meaning happens because in a faith community, we try to do it together. That's how it happens. We do it together. It's not about a verse or a passage. It's about a shared struggle. My suffering is shared by you. Your suffering is shared by me. Your suffering and my suffering, it's our collective suffering. We share it. It's the common lot of frail humanity. And that allows us to make meaning. My rabbi growing up was this wonderful man in Denver, Colorado named Rabbi Daniel Goldberger. I just loved him. And he worked for all his life and retired, and there was a goodbye dinner, and I flew into Denver for this dinner to be at his goodbye dinner back in the years when there were goodbye dinners. And one woman spoke, and I'll never forget what she said, her story. She said she's a survivor, and she's the only member of her family who survived the Shoah. All the rest of her family perished in the Shoah. And for so many years, she was asking the question, why, why, why? And she asked this of professors, and she asked this of theologians. She asked this of clergy of all kinds. Why? And in response, she got all kinds of answers. Why? God is dead. Why? God is hiding God's face. Why? God is searching for human beings. Why? God is contracting God's self. 
And she said, none of those answers ever worked. And then she heard that there was this new rabbi who came to Denver named Daniel Goldberger, and she made an appointment. And it was his first week. And she went to see him. And she shared her story of unspeakable loss. And she said when she was done telling her story and she asked the question, why, why, Rabbi Goldberger said absolutely nothing. Total silence. He let her story just hang out there unanswered. At last, finally, he said only one thing. He said, can I give you a hug? And she said, yes. And he got up, and he gave her a hug, and he said nothing else. And she said that hug brought her back to Judaism. That hug brought her back to life. That hug is why she davened at Rabbi Goldberger's service every Shabbos all the years of her life. What are we supposed to do about deaths of despair that were surging and now we have a pandemic to boot? The best answer to a death of despair are lives of hope. But lives of hope don't just happen. Lives of hope take work. Lives of hope have to be nurtured. Lives of hope have to be nurtured in communities of faith and communities of meaning. Shared struggle, shared dreaming, shared meaning making. Lives of hope happen when you do things that you believe in with people that you love, and you do it every day, and you do it every week. So I'm here to tell you, lives of hope are nurtured here. Every week, every day, every morning, every evening. And they will be at our services here until the end of time. Virtually for now, until it's safe to come back together, and one day, undoubtedly, together again in person. What George Burns' God says is so true. It works. It saves lives. It can save your life. See you in shul. Shabbat shalom.